Well, I want to welcome all the Liberty family, every campus and location, those of you who have joined us at Liberty Live Online. Uh, we have missionaries from around the world. We have those in the military from around the world, and then those right here in Hampton Roads in retirement centers, correctional facilities. It's always a joy to have you to join us, to be part of this worship experience. Liberty family at every campus, make a lot of noise and welcome all the church family. We're in a series going through the book of 1 Corinthians, and today we're going to be at chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'll just let you in on a little secret. Titles of the message uh, really is the hardest thing for me. I, I can study the text. I, I can, can try to find out exactly, using all the tools, what the text is saying. But when it comes to giving it a title, that is one of the hardest things that, that I struggle with. So I just prayed over this chapter. After the sermon was, was put together, I have prayed over it, prayed over it, prayed over it, and said, God, what is the title for this message? And I want you to see something. That's a good question. <laughs> no, seriously, I came to that conclusion based on the fact that I noticed something in the chapter. Five times, Paul says, do you not know? He says it in verse 2, in verse 3, in verse 15 and 16, and then again a fifth time in verse 19. In one chapter, five times, he asks this question. He says, do you not know? And it is very similar to what Jesus would ask in the Gospels. We'll read about it in Mark chapter 4, verse 13, Mark chapter 8, verse 21. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus would give a parable, and after the parable, he would say, do you not understand? Do you not understand? And so I want you to know, if Paul is asking the question and Jesus is asking the question, that's a good question. Amen? That's the title of the message today. That's a good question. And so let's pray and we'll get started. Father, thank you for your word, for what you're going to teach us today. Lord, I can't do this, but I pray that you will do it, that I will just be a vessel that you'll use to connect with your people. Right where they are, whatever they need to hear from you, Lord, you speak, your servants are listening. And I just thank you, Lord, that your word never returns void. I thank you for the power of the gospel. I thank you for the power of the word of God, sharper than a two-edged sword. So I pray that you will teach us and change us today, not just give us information, but transformation from the power of your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. When we look here... Uh, there are some things, some subjects that we see here in this chapter. And, and remember, he's, and I'll point it out to you, he'll say, do you not understand? Do you not understand? Do you not know? Do you not understand? And honestly, th these are new believers at Corinth. It, it is a young church. And, and so they don't understand, and they don't know. And, and therefore, I believe their answer could have been, your guess is as good as mine. You know, do you not understand? Your guess is as good as mine. I don't know. And so Paul is teaching them about several things. Here we go. First of all, he says, do you not understand about lawsuits? Do you not understand about lawsuits? Let's pick it up in verse 1. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law or to a lawsuit before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know? Here's the first time he says it. Do you not know? That the saints will judge the world. And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Trivial matters. Little things. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Verse 5, I say this to your shame. Is it so that there's not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law, lawsuit against another brother, and that before unbelievers. So let's just walk through this together. First of all, the Greeks were known for their courts, and litigation was just a way of life. People were constantly suing one another. They'd sue you for anything. They'd sue you over nothing. Sounds a whole lot like the day in which we live. Did you know that it's estimated that over 4 million lawsuits are filed every year in the U.S.? And that there are over 1 million 
registered lawyers. Listen, litigation is just a, a way of the American life. Uh, believers uh, at Corinth were doing business with one another, and then they would sue one another. So the church is losing their testimony. The church is losing their witness. Now, let me just say parenthetically, I think it's good that Christians do business with one another. I think we ought to support one another. I came into a staff meeting the other day, and I said, hey, have y'all seen this new place that's opened? It's by one of our church members, and I'm constantly doing that kind of thing. I think it's good that we support one another. Can I have an amen? But what happens when you pay somebody to do a job, and they don't finish it? What happens when they uh, uh, do a job, but they don't do a good job? Or it doesn't meet the standard or the expectation. Now, I want you to know this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, has been abused and misinterpreted uh, by Christians over the years. So I want us to find out two things. One, what does it say? And number two, what does it not say? What does it mean? And then I want you to know what it does not mean. Uh, first of all, uh, here's what Paul is saying. That the church should see to take care of family matters. If it's a trivial thing, if it is a small thing, then don't take one another to court. He is saying you ought to be able to work it out among yourselves or get a brother or sister or someone involved, a church leader, a mediator, and work it out. Everybody say work it out. He says here, believers one day will judge the world. Look at this. Do you not know that saints will judge the world? Uh, we know that Jesus, we call it the millennial reign of Christ, he will rule and reign on this earth a thousand years. And, and of course, this is all part of end times and last things. And saints will reign with him. Uh, we see uh, that talked about in Daniel chapter 7, verse 22. Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 and 27. And Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. Jesus is going to rule and reign. We're going to reign with him. He also goes on to say, and the, the world's going to be judged by you, so can't, can't you take care of, of small matters? Do you not know that we're going to judge angels? What's he talking about there? Well, the Bible says that there are angels, fallen angels, demons that are reserved for judgment and that saints will be with Jesus, that we'll be part of judging those fallen angels, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, you read about it in Jude 6. Now, if you're going to judge the world, Paul says, if you're going to judge angels, don't you think God's given us? Are you listening? Don't you think God's given us what we need for right now? Don't you think God's given us the wisdom, the truth, the justice, the love, the equity, the fairness, the kindness to be able to settle trivial matters? So, that's what smallest matters translate. Some of your translations will read uh, trivial. Some uh, will say petty. Uh, the whole idea, there are a lot of lawsuits that are just uh, frivolous lawsuits. And, and so, he's saying here, uh, you ought to be able to take care among yourselves uh, these issues. Uh, now, this is very important. He didn't say we can take care of every issue. Did you hear me say that? Say Amen. He's talking about small matters, trivial matters. Uh, there are some things that uh, are um, too complex, uh, too difficult for the church to try to take on. Uh, you have, have to remember the context. Believers, you know, brother, taking brother, brethren. He's talking about here two believers that are going to court either for personal gain or for revenge. And he says, that's not the way that Christians should act. That's not the way we operate. But this verse does not prohibit Christians from ever going to court. It does not say that a Christian can never go to court. There are some matters, I told you, that are not small. I mean, it's, let's just think of a few for a moment, you know. Um, uh, property disputes sometimes cannot be settled outside of court or court records. Uh, sometimes do, you look at child custody, you got, usually a court has to get involved. Child abuse, a, a court's got to get involved. Uh, divorce, ultimately the court has to make a ruling. Uh, court ordered protection, restraining orders, you've got to go to court. Did you know this? 
that in Virginia, which is technically a commonwealth, that churches cannot buy or sell property without going to court. Now, now uh, Dr. Jerry Falwell took it all the way to the Supreme Court. And, and he made it legal, ultimately, for churches to incorporate. But before that, churches were not incorporated. And if a church is not incorporated, a non-incorporated church, get this now, you've got to go to a local circuit court, and a judge has to rule on whether or not you can buy or sell real estate, buy or sell property. And so there are just some issues. You've got to go to court. That's my point. Are you with me? Now, the church should not try to handle sins that are crimes. Uh, you got to balance 1 Corinthians 6 with Romans 13. 1 Corinthians 6 says brother against brother, sister against sister. You shouldn't be taking uh, your, each other to court over trivial matters. Can't you imagine the group gathering? You know, we, we really push for you to do life together and getting in a group. And, and so we're sitting in a group and this person over here said, pray for me. I'm going to court next week and I'm suing them. You know, and they're saying, pray for me, because they're suing me. I mean, that's going to be a little tension that night. You know what I'm saying? And, and so, and then they try to get people. You know what it's like. They try to get somebody to go to court in their behalf. So half the church is going to court in behalf of this brother, and the other half is going in behalf to represent this brother or sister. And so he, he is saying here, uh, listen. We should balance it with Romans 13. Romans 13 says this, that all government, no matter what branch of the government, including the court system, that they are ministers of God, that God uses government. Are you awake? Say amen. So you've got to balance these two scriptures out. We also have to distinguish between a sin and a crime. If it's a crime, call the proper authorities. If it's a crime, we should not try to be handling it within the church. If it's a sin, handle it within the church if it's not a crime. Let me give you an example. Gossip is a sin, but don't call 911. 911, yes, can we help you? Um, sister so-and-so, she's been talking about me. They're going to laugh you, you out, you know. Don't, don't call and say, hey, I caught my teenager looking at porn. Don't call 911 for that. Don't call 911 if you got a family member that gets drunk, comes home, passes out. But if the drunk gets violent and abusive, call 911. You with me? You know, you just you, you got to use some common sense here, and you got to be able to distinguish between a sin and a crime. Let me just tell you, the church should never attempt to deal with a sex offender, a rapist, a pedophile internally. Now, look at the Catholic Church, how they tried to do that for years. No, a crime, you call the proper authorities. Are y'all getting something out of this message? All right, now look at verse 7 here. Let's pick up. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your what? To your brethren, talking about to a brother or sister in Christ. Here's the question you've got to ask. If it is a small matter, trivial matter, uh, you're doing business together, is it worth it to go to court? What's this going to do to the name of Jesus? What's this going to do to the cause of Christ? Let me tell you, it's better to lose financially than to lose spiritually. Many Christian attorneys advise believers to settle out of court. I believe that is what Paul is saying. If possible, settle out of court. And when you do, I believe that you'll be blessed. When you do, I believe, that, listen, if you go to court and you battle it out to the bitter end, it's going to end bitterly. You know, Jews would settle out of court. They would settle in the synagogue. Did you know under Roman law that Jews could hand down any sentence except the death sentence. That's why the Sanhedrin had to go to Pilate to get Jesus crucified. They could not carry out the death penalty, the death sentence. And so just like Jews carried out uh, their differences and settled them within the synagogue, Paul is saying that we ought to try to, to uh, settle them among one another 
as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, when two believers are in a dispute, both parties should first use Christian mediation. It ought to be voluntary. You ought to just try to work it out. And if that doesn't uh, reconcile the differences, then you can move to Christian arbitration. And that is where uh, a decision will be reached that will be legally binding only after uh, prayerful consideration, a spirit of humility, and, and, and both parties are seeking to glorify God and work this out in a way that it's not going to hurt the church and hurt the cause of Christ. So have you, have you, you understand what he's saying and what he's not saying here? All right. Well, let's move on. He, he's saying, don't you understand about lostness? Don't you understand about losses? Do you not know? Then he's going to talk about lostness. Let's look at it in verse 9. Do you not know? That the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. They're lost. They're unsaved. It says, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Do you get that? He says, the church is made up of all these people. But you were washed and you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. This is why you preach through books of the Bible. Because no pastor in his right mind is going to get up and preach on this list of sins today. All right? This is no fun. Really. But you want to be a part of a church that preaches the Bible. And I'm just telling you, there are a whole lot of churches, a whole lot of pastors, they just preaching on whatever topic they feel like is going to be popular. And I'm saying to you today, I'm just preaching the word. And, and I know what the world says. We're not supposed to judge anybody. Listen to me. Uh, no, we shouldn't judge these people. I get that. We should not judge one another when it comes to sin, regardless of what sin is. But hear me. When the world says don't judge one another, you've got to still understand God is judge. And when it says right here, don't be deceived, don't believe a lie that there's no God, no heaven, no hell, no judgment day. God is judge. And we're all going to stand before him one day. And, and the world says, well, we just need to love one another. Yeah, we need to love one another, treat people with respect, but we also have to love one another to tell each other the truth. All right? So here it is. He says here, neither fornicators... That particular word is just sexual sin in general. Sexual sin in general. It could be anything from pornography, uh, lustful thoughts. It could be um, hooking up, shacking up, in any kind of sexual sin in general. All right? And then you've got idolaters. Uh, we think about idolatry as a, a, a false religion. And, and people bowing down to a rock or a piece of wood. But let me tell you what idolatry is. It's loving someone or something more than you love Jesus. And the biggest idol is me first. The biggest idol is when we love ourselves more than we love God. Uh, it talks here about adulterers. This is married people having sex outside of their marriage. That's swinging that's open relationships, open marriages. Uh, uh, you, you say, hey, it's okay for you and your girlfriend to, to shack up and live together. You're not committing adultery. No, you're a fornicator, okay? So you're, don't play that game. It's all covered right here. You know, you, you look at it here, a lot of talk in our society about homosexuality, same-sex marriage. The reason it uses sodomites and homosexuals, talking about female and female or male and male, is talking about same-sex relations. Now, let me make it very clear. No one goes to hell because they're a homosexual or a sodomite, female, female, male, or male. You say, how can you say that? Because nobody goes to heaven because they're a heterosexual. Hello? You know why we go to hell? Lostness. And I want you to get this point. Here it is. You're not lost because you do one of these sins or any other sin that's, that, that may or may not be mentioned here. You, you, listen, you're not lost because you do one of those sins. You commit those sins and you live that kind of life because you are 
lost. And so he's explaining here about lostness. And and let me just say this, and then I'll move on, and I know you'll be glad, all right? But let me just say here, now, now please hear me. I want you to get this. Sexual desire, whether it's straight or gay, sexual desire apart from Jesus will always lead to sin. I don't care if you're straight or you're gay, if you got the urge to merge, (laughs) you just can't act on the urge. And you take that all the way down to a little child. If a little child wants to bite or scratch or hit, just because they have the urge, that means they can act on it. And as fallen human beings, we all have a lot of urges and fleshly desires that apart from Jesus will lead to sin. And all God's people sin. All right. So it says here, nor thieves. Well, that's easy. That's the guy that broke in your car or your house or the person that robbed the store, the convenience store. Why did they do it? They're covetous. They want what somebody else has. That's that basic sin of covetousness. Uh, nor drunkards. It's talking about an alcoholic. Uh, it, it's talking about a drug addict. Nor revilers. Reviler there means someone who uses their tongue to tear down another individual. We call it slander. And you know, have you ever noticed how uh, sin has gotten a new name over time? You know, nobody talks here uh, about uh, fornicators. No, we just cohabitate. You with me? It's not homosexual, sodomites. It's just same-sex relationships. You know, it, it, it's not here... Um, Drunkard. No, it's they have an illness. Well, yeah, I, I get it. But, but I'm also telling you, reviler. We wouldn't use that word today. Slander. Here's the way God's people say it. Well, I'm just plain spoken. I just speak my mind. I'm opinionated. No, you're a reviler. That's what the word of God says about you. All right, extortioners. An extortioner here is someone who takes unfair advantage of somebody, a swindler, uh, embezzlement. But then notice this. He says, and such were some of you. You know what that tells me? It doesn't matter what you struggle with or what your sin is, change is possible. Put your hands together and praise God. We all sin. We all struggle. And let me just say this. Any Christian could commit any one or more of these sins. All right? We all struggle with different things. But what he says here, get it, the unrighteous. When they're doing these things, it is a habit, it is a lifestyle. It's not the particular act or sin, but it's the fact that they are lost. Everybody say lostness. Lostness is what we're talking about here. Can a Christian fall, lapse, commit, struggle with any of these sins? Of course. But it's not your habit. It's not your lifestyle. And just like I said a moment ago, we don't have to give in to every struggle and every temptation. It says, but some were some of you, but you were washed. That word word washed there means this. You were given a new start. You were sanctified. It means you've been given a new lifestyle. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. Justified means you have a new standing with God. Now, here it is. Paul says, don't you know, don't you understand that since you have come out of these sins and God has set you free, even though you may still struggle, even though you still may be tempted, God has set you free so you do not live like a lost person. You've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified, so live like it. That's what he's saying. Stop taking one another to court over trivial things. Stop living uh, in a life of sin like you were before you met Christ or before uh, you knew what God's Word teaches. I I love this. A lot of, of couples come to liberty at all of our campuses and I've seen this for years now and they do cohabitate and they do live together and they come and they hear the word of God preached and they listen through the word of God and the power of the spirit of God 
uh, they'll come up and say, listen, we, we realize now we need to get married. When can you marry us? I can't tell you how often that happens. I mean, there'll be people come out of life track and they'll say, hey, listen, we need to get married. Is there a minister, a pastor, somebody who can marry us? We, we, we know we need to get married and we want to do that. Pray, put your hands together and praise God for all those testimonies. Well, he said, don't you understand about liberty? And I'm not talking about our church here. We're talking about freedom, okay? All right. Verse 12, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Uh, all things are lawful was a common phrase spoken in Paul's day. And so they would say, all things are lawful, so I can do this. Um, I'll show you another one in just a moment uh, that we're going to read that was a common phrase. And they were using it as an excuse to sin. The bottom line is this. They said, all things are lawful, and if it's lawful, then it's okay. Listen to your pastor. Just because something is lawful in the land does not mean it's right according to the word of God. And so it says right here, all things are lawful for me. The question is not, are all things lawful? Here's the question. Is it helpful? Is it beneficial? You say, I've got freedom. Well, let me tell you, if you've got freedom, you can stop. If you can't stop, you don't have freedom. He says right here, I will not be brought under the power of any. It literally means I'm not going to be mastered by anything. And you say, hey, I got the freedom. It's lawful. I can do anything I want to. Well, if you can't stop and you don't have any self-control, then you really do not have freedom. Then he wraps it all up, talking about lordship. And this, is, this covers it all. He said, don't you know about lordship? Food's for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy, destroy both it and them. That's the other phrase. They would say, all things are lawful. And in Corinth, they would say, hey, food's for the stomach and the stomach for food. And, and, and so they were using it as an excuse when it comes to sexual sin. He said, God will destroy them both. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality. So that's the subject he's addressing here in this statement, comparing it to food. But for, everybody say it, the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. He's talking about lordship. And, and he's basically saying this. You can't use this excuse that, hey, all things are lawful. And then turn around and say, hey, food's for the uh, body and the body for food. Because what they were basically saying is this. You get hungry, you eat. You get thirsty, you drink. So if you have a biological urge when it comes to sexuality, just act upon it. No. Let me tell you, you are not an animal acting on some urge or instinct. You are created in the image of God. And so he says here, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot, a prostitute? Certainly not. And do you not know that he who is joined with a prostitute, a harlot, is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Let me tell you, a Christian cannot do anything or go anywhere without the Lord. You've got the Holy Spirit living within you, so whatever you do, whatever, wherever you go, you're dragging Jesus with you. And so Paul says, remember that. Lordship. The, the question is this. If Jesus was standing in the room right there watching you, would you still do it? If Jesus was in the car with you, would you still do it? If, if Jesus was there in that hotel room, would you still do it? He's there. He's everywhere. And if you're a child of God, he's living within you. And so he's saying, hey, don't drag the Lord through a bunch of sin and shame. He set you free. So. He closes it out here. Flee. Everybody say flee. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. 
Or do you not know, this is the fifth time, do you not know, he asked this question, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He talks here about lordship, and he says, if Jesus really is Lord, then you can't go around saying, well, my body belongs to me. He said, no, your body belongs to the Lord. Your body belongs to God for two reasons. One, he created it, and, and number two, Jesus died on the cross to redeem it. And so your body does not belong to you. Your body belongs to the Lord. He says, flee. This is, this is such an important word. Everybody say, flee. It means run like crazy. All right? Run like crazy. So guys, if some girl comes up to you throwing her stuff around and, and, and says, what's your name? Your name, your first name is run, your middle name is like, and your last name is crazy. You run like crazy. <laughs> you know, I heard a preacher say one time, he said, single people should only wear running shoes. That's good. Sleep in your PJs and your running shoes. All right? Only wear running shoes. Flee the very appearance of evil. Flee sexual immorality. This is the will of God. The Bible says that you flee sexual immorality. So ladies, let me say a word to you. If some guy takes you out for a nice dinner, takes you to the movies, buys you butter popcorn, you don't owe him anything. And if he starts acting like you owe him some favor or acting like he owns you, run like crazy. Flee is what the Bible says. So it all comes down to lordship. Everybody say lordship. Jesus died and rose from the dead and will raise us up from the dead, he says, to, listen, because he's Lord of all. He is Lord. He is Lord. He's risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I'm telling you, there's coming a day when everyone who's ever lived will bow their knee before Jesus and confess him Lord. But on that day, it'll be too late. So I'm asking you today to bow the knee of your heart and give your life to Jesus and confess him as Lord of your life. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. No one's moving around. I don't know what sin you struggle with. But here's the good news. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. Jesus died on the cross to pay for all our sin. And I don't know what sin you struggle with, but I know this. His grace is greater than any struggle that you have with sin. Would you right now call on him and ask him to wash you, to justify you, sanctify you, just right where you are. Just pray this in your heart. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I struggle. And I'm asking you to wash me clean. I'm asking you to sanctify me, to give me a new start. I'm asking you to justify me that I would be right with God and have peace with God. I believe you died on the cross, rose from the dead, and I confess you as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for loving me so much that you would die and take the punishment I deserve. Thank you for a home in heaven. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and help me to walk with you and to live for you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, and everyone said.